Welcome to Dare to Leap, a conversation and community supporting women just like you to gain the freedom, flexibility, and financial security you desire and deserve with CEO and founder of Virtual Expert Training, Kathy Guggenauer. This is Dare to Leap, and now here's the powerhouse tiara-wearing Kathy Guggenauer. Welcome, everybody. Today, I have the great pleasure of interviewing David Schreiner Khan. After 28 years as a highly skilled employee, David was told that his job was over. In spite of the immediate trauma and fear, he knew that as his next step, he'd rather work for himself and have more control over his destiny. Anybody think that sounds a little familiar to my story? Well, David and I um, are siblings from an, I was going to say brothers for another mother, sisters from another mister, siblings from another, I don't know what that would be. <laughs> Comment, let us know what that would be. <laughs> but that was back in 2006. And today, David is a thriving entrepreneur, podcaster, and speaker. He is guiding highly skilled professionals who are recovering from a late career job loss and who yearn to impact the world with their knowledge and creativity by becoming successful entrepreneurs. And I will just add something personal here at the end, which is David is absolutely filled with knowledge, wisdom, and is gonna share some amazing insights here. So please tune in. You might even wanna get ready to take notes. So welcome, David. Thanks so much, Kathy. It is great to be here with you. David, I'm going to just tell people, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you might want to go check it out because David is one handsome dude. I'm telling you right now, he's got that silver hair that I love. And David, you look so physically fit. Do you um, work out a lot? Um, Eat healthy? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about things? a lot, but I, um, I, I do work out some. Yes. Yeah, well, you you look fantastic. So I love your story, you know, because I really relate to it a lot. And could you just go back and tell us a little bit about that? Because when you said they told you your job was over and then you had the trauma and fear, and I know a lot of our listeners have experienced that same thing and might not know what to do about it. So could you share that story with us? Sure, and, and actually, to a certain extent, it starts much earlier in my career. I was trained as an engineer. I worked as a chemical engineer in corporate for the first uh, few years of my career. And um, much to my surprise, just after I had my second review in my second job, which was a, um, a really good performance review and, and a big raise, um, a month later, I got fired. Um, cause the, a the month kind of, later after that, right. wow, that had to be shocking. Um, I, yeah, I was like totally not expecting it. You know, when I think about it now, um, all the warning signs were there because the company that I worked for had, um, uh, was in a, a market that had kind of fallen apart and they lost about half their business. So oh. it was, um, I think it was kind of inevitable that they were going to end up firing half the employees. Um, and I actually had thought about doing something entrepreneurial at that point. I was totally clueless. I didn't know anybody who was an entrepreneur. I didn't know how to do it. Um, and I ended up, um, you know, the, 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 the short story is I ended up going into the not-for-profit sector because I just wanted to do something that I felt was more meaningful. Um, people thought who I knew thought I was crazy because I took a, um, sizable pay cut to get into the, um, f into the job that I, that I went into. Um, although within a few years, I was actually making about as much money as I had as an engineer and it was a lot more rewarding. And then I was in that, in, in the same field for over 20 years. Um, and, and for probably, you know, there was this little bug in my ear the whole time that I wanted to 
do something where I would have more control. Um, I'm a little bit of a control freak, like most entrepreneurs. <laughs> and so, um, I mean, the good thing about the career that I ended up in was I was in executive roles the whole time. So I had a lot of authority and a lot of leeway over what I did, how I did it, when I did it. Um, so it actually provided a lot of the same kinds of um, what the perceived, I guess, freedom that um, entrepreneurs think they they have. And um, but at the same time, I I really wanted um, other people to have less control over what I did and when I did it and how I did it. So I had, um, you know, I kind of peaked in my job, and there was some political stuff that was going on that had nothing to do with me that was probably going to affect my job. I sort of at that point I I saw the handwriting on the wall, and I decided that. Um, that I wanted to just be a consultant. I hired a lot of consultants. Um, I, I knew people that were consultants. I figured, you know, they can do it, I can do it. And um, I, I did wait until somebody else made the decision so that the timing wasn't my choice, although I was, you know, more or less resigned to, to, um, to make the switch. And frankly, I didn't think that it was such a big switch to go from being an employee to being a consultant in the same field. It wasn't like I was changing fields like I'd done earlier in my career. Although, you know, a lot of people I knew well, again, thought I was crazy. And the, <laughs> the funniest thing is, you know, looking back on it 14 years ago, the, the world has changed and, and, um, and our oh, system of work yes. in America has changed a lot in the last decade plus. But the, the most common question I got from, from friends and colleagues was, David, what are you going to do about health insurance? And I was like, mm -hmm. I'll buy it, you know, you, I, and it, in my role in, um, in my job, I had always been the group administrator. So I knew all about how that kind of stuff worked and I knew how much it cost. So it wasn't a surprise to me that I just had to buy it and, and set up a group for my company. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it's funny that that was the the biggest question. People were like, "You can't, you know, you you can't function without that particular employee benefit, among others." Um, but um, but anyway, so, and so I, I will tell the, you, I still hear that to this. I still hear that to this day, even though it's getting sillier and sillier, a sillier and sillier question. Yeah, because a lot of companies don't even offer it anymore. That's yeah. correct. Yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, but anyway, so that was fourteen years ago. Um, you know, in, in my business, my own business has evolved and has shifted. Uh, the market that we serve has shifted. I started off as a solopreneur, um, nonprofit management consultant, I uh, started picking up some private business clients, um, uh, after I started doing some business networking and really got into the whole like entre entrepreneurship thing. And, um, and I guess kind of connected to my own journey. Um, really began to focus a lot more on entrepreneurship for um, professionals who are using their own expertise as as what what they what it is they primarily offer for their audience. So somebody who's working in the same field, but instead of being an employee, is now either a consultant or a coach. That's the most common path. And then um, and I started doing some content creation first with a blog and then podcasting. Um, and that also has evolved. It started off, um, the podcast started off as a more general entrepreneurship podcast. And in 2014, when we launched, there were a lot fewer podcasts than there are today. Um, so <laughs> now, right. So now like with everything else, the, the better you define your, your niche and your target audience, the greater impact you can have. And, um, you know, you and I were chatting a little before we we started recording that, um, you know, now I host two podcasts, Smashing the Plateau and Going Solo. Uh, Smashing the Plateau was the one that we launched in 2014. And, and the reality is they both serve the same audience. They both serve consultants and coaches that are building their business following a long career as an employee. Um, going Solo is really for early stage consultants and coaches, I would say like zero to three years in their business, where um, they're really just trying to 
build the foundation and create some sustainability. And then smashing the plateau is more for like, I would say roughly three years and more where they're, they've created some kind of model where they're producing income on some kind of consistent basis. It may be cyclical, but, but at least they're, you know, they're, they're paying their bills and they're trying to figure out, you know, how do I take what I've built and make it more the kind of business that I want? Yeah. Um, so lots of questions to unpack there that I love your journey. I love what you've gone through and I know you have so much wisdom around all of that. So I want to ask you first, when you mentioned you thought it would be easy to go from an employee to a consultant doing the same thing, you didn't let us know if it was easy or what challenges you found around that. So would you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I had never been involved in marketing and sales. And um, uh, I'm not someone who's so great at tooting my own horn. Um, so learning how to do marketing and sales was was a big challenge. When I connected with people that needed what I offered, um, that was not as hard. Um, you know, there were some little things like in the beginning, I was clueless about pricing. Um, I um, you know, being able to, to, uh, invoice clients, which is a challenge that if they've never, you know, like clueless, how do I even, how do I even get paid? Um, that whole process <laughs> is right. For some people, they, they just don't know how to do it. Um, right, you know, so I, right. I'd always been responsible in my roles for finance and operations. So I knew, um, I'd seen lots of invoices in my life. Um, so I knew more or less what to do when it came to invoicing. I was pretty clueless when it came to pricing. And, um, you know, my initial pricing model was, was, um, time for money. It was, it was mm -hmm. either an hourly or a daily rate, which is what a lot of consultants do. Um, yes. I learned after a while that that wasn't so healthy, that there were, there were better ways to do it. I started getting into value pricing and learning about project fees and, and recurring revenue models. Um, so, um, but, but the, yeah, the, the marketing and selling was, was hard at the beginning. And I remember um, about a year into my business, a friend of mine who also um, like me had been an employee for, um, for several decades and then, um, went out on her own, invited me to a BNI um, networking meeting, and mm -hmm. I'd never been to anything like it before. Um, and I walked in, and I was like, "I have to get up and give a sixty-second commercial." I'm like, "Oh my god, <laughs> um, I'm not even sure what I'm marketing." <laughs> I'm sure you did a great job and I, I'll bet you have a really good one now. What's your 60, 60 second pitch now? Oh, now we help, yeah. we, we help high achieving professionals build their own consulting or coaching business following a late career job loss. Not even 60 seconds, it's probably 15. No. And isn't that, and it's very powerful. I mean, that just, that, that is a lot of emotion involved in that, which I think is really one of the important things. It's easy to understand, but it also grabs you grabs you by the gut. I think for me, that's where I felt it was. Oh yeah. Late today job loss. Oh yes. I know that feeling. <laughs> so congratulations on all your successes, David. Um, so let's talk a little bit further about when you first made that transition. So for anybody out there right now, that's thinking, yes, I want to do what David did like him. I really want to become an entrepreneur now. I want to control my own destiny. I want to go solo. What are your top one or two tips for them? Um, find a small group of like-minded people that you can meet with every week. Um, that's one. Second is get some people that you can go to for advice. Um, as mentors, coaches, um, th there are lots of people you can hire and you can pay money to coach you. Um, if, mm -hmm. if you're doing, if you're doing that, then do your homework, do due diligence because there's no barrier to entry to call yourself a coach. It's not like there's a, um, um, a, a, a licensing mechanism. It's not like becoming a, a physician or an attorney 
or um, you know, even certain kinds of, of different kinds of therapy um, has they have licensing requirements. There's no licensing mm -hmm. requirement for a coach. Um, so people or consultant can, or a consultant. So um, people can charge whatever they want um, and whatever they can get. Um, some people are really good at marketing themselves, but they have never, they're trying to coach people on stuff they have never done. Um, the reason you want to hire a coach is you want to save time and save money and make more money faster. And so you want, it's like, if you want to learn how to improve your tennis game, you're going to hire somebody to coach you who has played tennis and knows how to do it. You want to learn how to play piano, you're going to hire somebody who can who knows how to play piano to teach you. So a coach is going to teach you to do things faster with fewer mistakes. Um, and it may cost you a lot of money. But frankly, I've learned this. The, like for me, the hardest thing when I'm trying to hire somebody who's going to cost a lot of money is finding the right person. Um, like mm -hmm. I know, I, I kind of know where I want to get to. But but figuring mm -hmm. out what the steps are. I don't even know what questions to ask. So finding the right mm -hmm. person often is really hard. Um, but there are a lot of, so there are a lot of free resources or low cost resources that will also be helpful. So people like to be asked to give advice. So who do you know who is doing something that has something that's similar to, to where you wanna be? Um, so, um, who's in a position where they know the kinds of people that you're trying to sell to? Um, Cause those mm -hmm. people can, uh, if they get to know you, like you and trust you, or maybe they already know you, like you and trust you, they're your friends. They're in a great position to refer business to you or to at least make introductions to make the, the business acquisition piece easier. So find people that can help you. Don't be afraid to ask them for help. And always, 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 when you're asking them for help, say to them, how can I help you? And be the first one to say that. Even if you think that you, you don't have any idea how you can help them, it's really important to ask them. And you'd be surprised. Um, there are ways you can help other people, even if they, it seems like they're so far ahead of you in what it is you're trying to do. You may have skills and experience that, that would be useful to them. So, so find people to help you. You know, the Small Business Administration has free stuff. SCORE has free or low cost stuff. There's a lot of low cost or free stuff that's available. Think about who you already know, who is an entrepreneur or a consultant or a coach or whatever, whatever business you're trying to build. Find some people who've done something similar and just ask them, you know, would they be willing to have a cup of coffee with you periodically? Um, you know, nowadays with, uh, or, a, with COVID. or a Zoom coffee chat right now. Yeah, you know what? Zoom coffee chats are, frankly, for many of us, they're easier than a cup of coffee. You don't have to go anywhere. Absolutely. Um, you know, I do this all the time. People reach out to me. I'm certainly willing to have a, you know, a, a half an hour conversation with somebody I don't know, see if there's a way I can be helpful. Um, you know, uh, but anyway, so so the two things are find a group of people to meet with who are peers, because um, they'll have the same mm -hmm. mindset that you're going to have. And then find some some uh, mentors or guides or people that can ha give you some shortcuts on the process. Mm -hmm. And I like that you said um, you should pay for your coach and it might be quite expensive. Um, what's your philosophy behind uh, saying that? Like why, well, why do you feel like they need to pay experience. and potentially pay, pay well? Um, because I can tell you when I, especially when I haven't known the steps to go from point A to point B, the time that it takes me to figure out those steps, there's a lot of trial and error in there. Um, often it can be many, many months. Whereas if I hired somebody who has gone through this and knows what to do, that person will tell me, just do this, do this, do this, do this. So instead of it taking me six months, it'll take me a month, right? That's a huge right. savings. I will also, huge. I've had lots of experiences where um, I'm, I'm thinking of one in particular where I hired somebody um, to help with a project. And um, I didn't have the, um, it, there's a lot of trial and error between me and the person I've hired to kind of figure it out. And even though I'm not paying a lot per hour or per month for the person I've hired, if I had somebody coaching me, instead of it taking 
three to six months where I'm paying out a very modest amount, um, I'd pay somebody else a high amount to sort of get the setup going. And then I could spend, um, use the money that I'm spending on the team member to implement as opposed to figure out the strategy. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I also uh, find- I, 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 I'll, I'll tell you one, one story to illuminate this. Like, okay. So, so when, um, when, I, when I first started blogging, which was the first, co- first piece of content creation that I did, um, the reason I wanted to do it was I looked at other consultants and to see who I thought was doing a better job than me. And the ones that I noticed were people that were creating content. And in those days, it was mostly through blogs. And I thought, okay, um, I don't know how to do this. Um, and sitting down and writing blog posts is like not my favorite activity. So I hired a college student to help. And it was great. Um, the person I hired was terrific. It was a, he was a journalism major and a really good writer and somebody who had his own blogs so that he knew how to do it. Um, it took us probably, I'm going to guess maybe of planning before the actual blog went live. And I'm willing to bet if I hired somebody who knew how to create a blog for consultants, I probably could have done the whole thing in a month. Now it didn't, I mean, I wasn't paying the college student a huge amount of money. So it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't a huge expense, but it still took a lot of time. It took a lot of my time and I probably would have had the whole thing done much faster if I had hired Mm -hmm. somebody to coach me on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, there are some people who, when they hear the word mentor, they think of free. Um, What do you think about the downfalls, the negative side to doing uh, something like that free? Not you providing it free, but, but the person receiving it for free. You know, it depends on the person. So like when I first started my consulting business, um, Mm -hmm. there was a, a business school professor that I was um that i had a relationship with who um was willing to meet me periodically for lunch if um you know if i reached out to him and Mm -hmm. he was really helpful in giving me some um some advice and also gave me some great referrals um Mm -hmm. and it was something he'd like to do um he wasn't expecting me to pay him for it um Frankly, mm-hmm. he wouldn't even let me pay, like treat him for lunch. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's like, it depends on the person. And on the other hand, yes. there are people, right? There are people um, who have expertise and they make their, their living by selling their expertise. So you're taking advantage of them if you're asking them yes. to mentor you. Like, like in the case that I mentioned with this professor, you know, he was making a good living between his, his, his teaching role and his own consulting business. Um, you know, I, I knew that he did this with some, and I had a friend who was also in the same program I was in, who also became friendly with him. So I knew that he did this for a limited number of people and he was willing to do it. And I think he liked doing it. Mm -hmm. So I think it really depends on the person. And the relationship that you have with that person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some people like there's sometimes when it's like, if you're offering, if you, offer to pay somebody for something, they almost get insulted. But -hmm. you also, the flip side is you don't want to take advantage of those people and you don't want to take too much of their time. It's it's a really delicate balance to figure out. Right. Versus when you're paying someone well to teach that to you. Uh, you can ask them everything you want and contact, you know, you, you have a much clearer relationship there where you're, they're available to you. You know what, Kathy, I think in either case, I think it's important to um, to set expectations on for both parties mm, and to like communicate that. what those expectations are. So right. I, I don't see anything wrong with if you're if you have a potential relationship with somebody who could mentor you and probably wants to do it for free to just ask them and say, um, you know, I'm trying to learn how to do this. Um, mm-hmm. 
I'm, I'm willing to hire somebody to do it. Um, I'm mm -hmm. grateful that you're willing to help me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, how, do, how do you want to proceed? Because what would be most beneficial to me would be some kind of structure and consistency in, in getting advice from somebody like you. Um, you know, I'm willing to pay for it if, if this is not what you're looking for in the relationship. Um, you know, if mm -hmm. the payment part isn't what you're looking for, that's fine. Just tell me what the parameters are. And I don't want to mm -hmm. take advantage of you. And I'm grateful to learn from you. Just be straight. I love that advice. Yes, I love that yeah. advice. No matter which way you go, get that those set those expectations, establish the boundaries, and say what you want out of the relationship. I love that too, David. That's really good. What you want out of of um, working with them. So one of the challenges that I see a lot, especially when people are not paying a significant amount of money for the consulting or coaching is that they then go around and consulting shop or coach shop or do lots of free stuff or you know pay a little bit for a lot of different opinions and it just gets them confused have you experienced that with people that you've worked with who pe people who have been your clients or people who have come to you and gone, I'm just so confused and overwhelmed. Uh, I see 10 different things, ways that I could price this. And I don't know how to do that. See anything um, like that? I, I do see people. Well, I, what I see actually more than that is people that are not willing to invest in themselves, right? If you, yes. if you are in business for yourself, as a consultant or a coach or call yourself a freelancer, whatever it is, or you're running a company, there are things that you know and things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. And if you want your business to develop and to grow, you need to always be learning. And <laughs> so, right, and, yeah. and some of that learning is going to cost you money. And it's mm -hmm. also going to take you time. Um, and you mm -hmm. just need to be really clear in your own mind what is it that you want to change from where you are now? And how long do you want it to take? Mm -hmm. And how much, um, how much greater net income do you want to be bringing in at the end of this process compared to where you mm -hmm. are now? Um, so given, given the time frame and amount of time you want to put in and what you want to get out of it financially, how much are you willing to invest in the process? And some of that mm -hmm. investment is going to be stuff that you're going to learn yourself, personal development. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if yeah. I'm trying to make, let's say I want to make $100,000 more net income a year from now compared to today, um, am I willing to invest $10,000 in the process? Of course, that's that's a you know that's a great return. That's on a no-brainer. Yeah. So yeah. what? So would I spend ten thousand dollars on a coach if what I need primarily is coaching? Of course I would. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So what I but what I see is um, people that want to achieve something, some specific objective, but mm -hmm. they're not willing to invest anything in them in themselves in the process or any any money. Mm -hmm. And frankly, mm -hmm. they're also reluctant to try new things. And you're oh, wow. you, right. <laughs> so I'm sorry, I'm laughing, but wow, I don't know that person's going to succeed. Well, yeah, but that, so what I see for people like that is they struggle to make a living period because yes. the, the truth about entrepreneurship, and it's a very different mindset than being an employee. When you're an employee, if you're wrong more than 10% of the time, you're probably going to get a bad review. As an entrepreneur, if you're right more than 10% of the time, you're probably doing really well. And I, <laughs> right, entrepreneurship, it's a- I love that. It's an iterative trial and error process, right? You, you create a plan, you take a step, you look at the results, you, you learn from the results, you, make your, you adjust your plan a little bit for the next step. And you just keep mm -hmm. doing this every day, every week, mm -hmm. every month, every year and over time you're more successful it takes a lot of focus and discipline and, and diligence mm -hmm. perseverance um but it is but definitely unless you're doing something that's making you uncomfortable you are not growing oh that is so true yeah i i feel uncomfortable every day and i know i'm doing well <laughs> exactly
Yeah. So um, we've been talking about like that in those initial, uh, you know, starting to go slow, low, making that transition. And you've given some great tips on that. Let's switch to the other hat you wear, which is smashing the plateau. So those people, and before we make that transition, I just want to mention one more thing here. I think a lot of what you were talking about just now was uh, time versus money. And sometimes when you're just starting out, you might have a lot more time because you don't have a lot of clients yet than money. So you could invest some of that time. For one thing, you got to invest it to learn how to market and sell yourself, right? Because that's going to be really important. And then you might spend the money on the coaching like you were talking about. But does that make sense? Is that yes. kind of your philosophy? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that okay. makes sense. Then as your business is growing and you hit that plateau, perhaps, um, for me, I can tell you that I had I have no time. I mean, my time is so much more valuable than the money because I can make more money, but I can't create more time. So I feel like it flipped for me. Do you think that happens for most people? Yes, it definitely flips. Um, yeah, you, you, you definitely, you can always make more money, but there are 168 mm -hmm. hours in a week and you should not be working mm -hmm. all of them. <laughs> really? Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> and you definitely so, can't work more than 168 because they just don't exist. <laughs> That's right. So for those uh, kind of describe um, what it felt like for you when um, maybe you reached that plateau and then how did you get past it? Um, so for me, there were a few plateaus. I um, you know, I mentioned earlier on that I started off by charging a time-based rate. Um, and then I started learning about value-based pricing and project fees. Um, one of the plateaus that I reached was, um, it was actually a few years into the recession that started in 2008 when I was putting out a lot of proposals, spending a lot of time working on proposals, um, some of which were for existing clients just for, for new projects and not getting great conversion. Um, it wasn't resulting in a lot of sales. And, and not charging for the proposal. And not charging for the proposal. Yeah. yeah. So that was a lot of time you were spending, not making any money there. Yeah. Right. That's so I started, right. So I, so I started, um, I learned about, um, um, creating, uh, different, uh, programs as the, as a business model where, um, instead of writing a proposal, I could meet with a, meet with somebody, charge them a very modest amount they would get some kind of outcome and some clarity about what they needed to do next. And then we could talk about a next step if there was one. And so I stopped writing proposals. I started getting paid right from the beginning. Um, so that was a big, big change. And then I right, started- that's huge. Um, another shift, which was a mindset shift more than it was um, uh, an activity shift, which is as, especially for, for those of us that are, that are um, high achieving professionals where we have an expert, where we have expertise in a field, we get excited by solving complex problems. And, um, and, and I was thinking about prospect as having a particular problem. And I shifted to thinking about what's the recurring problem that a prospect has and how can I solve mm. the recurring problem? Because that leads to ongoing work at a steady fee. Yes, I love that shift. That's such an important shift. Yes, so, so today um, for our um, uh, sort of a, a hybrid of consulting and coaching, I would say sort of the, the guidance work that we do, it's, um, almost all is recurring revenue, which is, um, takes a lot less marketing and selling. It's, uh, <laughs> no joke. it's a lot <laughs> better for cash flow and, and financial planning. Uh -huh. Um, it, it's, uh, yeah, that, that's a much better model. And I, you know, it took me a yeah. while. So that, that was a major plateau for me. And then as mm -hmm. far as like the time for money is concerned, um, I think pretty hard about any kind of um, anything I'm going to say yes to 
about whether it is producing revenue or not, or if it's not mm -hmm. producing revenue, what's the likelihood that it's going to lead to revenue? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you get get to the point where you're you've got to think carefully about your time, uh, it's way more important to say no to things than to say yes to things. In the beginning of your business, the first couple of years it's really important to be able to say yes, especially to things that are going to put money in your bank account. Mm -hmm. When you've been in business for a while and you have steady cash flow, saying no is actually more important. Oh, I love that. So we've got two different things that we're looking at, time and money and yes and no. And they both flip going from your first uh, zero to three years and then from three plus on. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's probably even like another one, like revenue that you get to or something like that, but we're not going to go that far today. <laughs> Listeners, if you're already in love with David and you want to learn more from him and get his guidance, tell us, David, how, uh, number one, who do you love to work with? And I know a little bit about that already, but if you can go even a little further, somebody listening to this going, wow, I would really like to work with them, but, and you know, everybody has this, you know, reason why you might not be a good fit for them in their own mind. So tell a little bit about who you like to work with. Maybe, you know, if there's something that you're like, but this isn't the type I want and then how they can get in touch with you. Um, We're not done with this interview yeah. yet. I just want to do that at this point. Th thank you, Kathy. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I would say um, it's high achievers that are willing to do things that make them uncomfortable with some guidance. Oh, I like that. So coachable. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I can offer all kinds of advice, but unless mm -hmm. you're willing to take the advice and do something with it, then mm -hmm. it's kind of pointless for you to invest any money in our help. Yeah, and it's it will be frustrating for both of you. Yes, and I and I've had clients <laughs> like that, and it's um, it generally doesn't go very well. Yeah, because you really want them to get great results. That makes you know. I, I'm sure you're like me. I can tell you are with us because you're a, you're a very giving, generous person with your time and your your knowledge. It it you know fulfillment comes for me by seeing someone that I'm coaching um, or doing consulting with or training to see them grow and reach their goals that they wanted or even exceed those goals. How about you? Oh, the same. Yeah. And, and um, you know, we've had some long-term clients that have um, done, overcome really challenging odds and done well. Yeah. That's yeah. really exciting. It's, it, it is so rewarding to know that you've helped somebody, um, especially a small business, because small business is very personal. It's really about your own oh, personal yes. goals. And when you're able to, like I have one client um, who comes from a very modest background and you know, one, one of his goals for his company is to be able to provide a, a living wage for low skilled workers. Mm. Right. Um, and if, and if I'm able to help somebody like that create yes. stability in his business so that he can provide for these families of, of the people that work for him, that is so rewarding. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I actually find that to be one of the most rewarding things about having my own business that I didn't even ever think about when I first started was how much impact I can have not just on that one person I'm working with, but on their family and anybody that they then help to grow also. It's just an amazing feeling. Do you yes, agree? Um, absolutely. Which I, uh, as I don't, maybe you did, but I never got that experience as an employee for somebody else. I was always so isolated in this just one little thing and I never saw the big picture and I never felt like I was really helping anybody. Um, well, I did feel like I was helping people when I was in the not-for-profit sector. Definitely when I was an engineer, no, I didn't feel any of that at all. Yeah. Which and is I was part of the reason I left the field. So. Yeah. So for our listeners who are thinking, wow, this sounds really awesome and I would love to be able to do that. But 
maybe I can't. Maybe, oh, David, he's obviously super smart and he's obviously really courageous, but what if I can't? What do you want to say to those people who really want to do this, but just don't quite have the confidence yet to make that leap? Well, first of all, I'd be happy to speak with you. You can get in touch with me, go to our website. You can listen to the podcast episodes. We have hundreds of episodes up, um, smashingtheplateau.com. There's a contact form there. You can get in touch with me. You can actually call a phone number in the US um, that gets answered live nine to five Eastern time, which is 212-731-0770 and just um, ask to schedule time with me. David, wow. See how generous you are? You just proved me right. <laughs> you know, Kathy, uh, um, uh, some some uh, podcast hosts ask the question, what are your favorite tools? And, and I yeah. say the telephone because it's like... <laughs> People are afraid to pick up the phone and make a phone call. And it's- Absolutely. It's, right? um, it's an easy way to connect quickly with people. And we actually, you know, for that reason, I make sure that somebody live answers the phone who can, who can talk to you when you call. Oh, that's incredible. That is almost unheard of these days, quite honestly. You know that, right? I mean, I that's know, why you, the way you said it was like, and you will, someone will actually answer the phone. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. And they'll talk to you and they'll ask you about what, yeah. what you're, why you're calling and how, how we can help you. And then we'll go from there. Ah, oh, that's, I, you know what? I'm thinking about making that call, even though I already know you just to have that connection with somebody <laughs> that's pretty pitiful uh, to be feeling that way. But um, you know, I know a lot of our listeners probably are feeling the same way about that. So there is one more topic that I want to circle back around to because I feel like this is a really important one that most people don't talk about. And you and I have already talked a little bit about this uh, in a previous conversation we had, which is that trauma that you experience after you have been released from that job for whatever reason it is, and before you're actually making money in your new career. So could you talk a little bit about that and how people can get through that? Sure. Um, so I certainly felt it. Um, I've felt it each time it has happened to me and it's happened to me, as you've already heard, more than once in my life. Um, and even, even when it is anticipated, um, like I said to you, uh, I knew it was coming, yet the day that it happened, it was still very traumatic. Um, and even though I had a plan in place of what I was going to do, the... Uh, emotional reaction to somebody else saying they don't want you anymore is really tough. Um, mm -hmm. And I've had lots of conversations with guests on my shows and also privately about what that feels like. And people talk about trauma. They talk about grief. They talk about shame. They talk about guilt, right? Especially if you're, um, let's say, you're over the age of 50 and you have... Um, that's usually a time of life if you have a family when there are other people whose livelihood um, is very dependent upon your income. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of guilt with all of a sudden, we're going to have to change our lifestyle. You know, I know people that have lost their homes and they have, you know, they've hit rock bottom financially. Um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you look at some of the, they're, they're actually... Much to my surprise, there, there is not a whole lot written about job loss for um, workers that are, I would say, 25 years plus in the workforce. Um, but the, the, when I do see th articles about it, um, the statistics indicate that it is very common. Um, it's way more common than people realize. And frankly, the reason why, why I started a second podcast was I discovered that there were a lot of people from Smashing the Plateau that I had already interviewed that went from employment to consulting and they did it because they got fired. But they didn't talk about the fact that they got fired because there is the shame and the guilt and the, and the trauma. Um, I had a therapist um, on my show who talked about the grieving process and how when you lose a job, there are a lot of similarities psychologically to losing a loved one and you actually have to go through the process. So 
um, the first thing is to recognize that you are going to have strong emotional reactions to being fired and it is okay. And, and you're not the only one who has experienced this and you're not the only one who is experiencing and feeling what you're feeling. Um, so just recognize that you do have this emotional reaction and what you can do about it is um, there are things you can do that will, um, that will help. One is like with any grieving process, it takes time. So to the extent that you're financially capable of actually taking time when you're not focused on work, you're gonna be better off. Um, I remember one of my guests on my show was a friend of mine would, um, was well paid in his corporate career. So he had the money to do this, but he literally took a year when he didn't focus on what he was gonna do next. Now, not everybody can do that, um, but he said it really helped him figure out what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it. And it gave him, and he said he felt like totally beat up by his job. Um, it was a high pressure job and it was very toxic and he needed time to basically to detox from the job. So time is, is important. If you can't afford to not bring an in income, one thing you can do is try to do something that you know is going to be interim. So you're not focused on turning what you're doing into something bigger. You're just focused on, I'm going to do this for now. And to the extent that I have some some spare time, I'll detox and I'll think a little bit about what I want to do long term. So like an interim job is a great thing to do. If you can do something that's totally different than what you were doing, just get paid some money to pay the bills. You know, that that's also helpful. Um, people talk about, you know, doing something that is like very different. I remember I had a conversation with a friend of mine recently about how the act of um, uh, when he got fired, he took a drawing class and it just helped um, get his mind off of what he had gone through and what he was going through. So yeah, so different kinds of activities can be really helpful. Um, so yeah, so you, you need like whatever you can do to create this kind of breathing space before you do something new, if to the extent that you can. Such great tips. And thank you so much for sharing all of that, because during that, my dog decided to bark nonstop and I was able to mute myself. <laughs> the power of so technology, if, Kathy. <laughs> if he starts again, forgive me. Um, so, you know, I have a friend who has just gone through what you were talking about. Your friend went through as far as losing the job. And she told me that her that there were just waves of shame washing over her and it just felt like she couldn't even move literally her goal was to exercise every day and that was it that was her only goal just to get up and move um so i love that you shared that because it is it is so powerful that shame and until we get through that there's just no way you can really, you know, jump in and do something on start your own business and do all that. You you can't even get out of the bed hardly. Yeah. And it make it's really hard to market and sell yourself when you're feeling <laughs> when you're feeling yes. uh guilt and shame and you're yes. what it means is your self-confidence is not particularly high. Um, oh, yeah. you need a lot of self-confidence to market and sell. Yeah. You know, I love that idea that you have of doing something totally different. Like I immediately thought I could work at Starbucks. I could drive an Uber. You know, I'm sitting here thinking of all those different things that I could do. Um, you know, like if you like to be outside, you know, do some lawn mowing or go work at a garden shop or something like that. Or even uh, I'll tell you something that really makes me know right away that, oh, I can't wait to get get back to working as an entrepreneur is uh, work as a waitress or uh, in retail. And then I'm like, woo, I can't wait to have my business back. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's really true. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much for sharing all of that because hopefully somebody uh, who is going through that right now can listen to this and I'm going to be contacting my friend and say, please listen to this podcast because hopefully it will help you. Uh, we've all been there. I don't know anyone, David, who has not 
lost a job, whether it's, you know, they got fired or laid off or something these days. I mean, I just don't know anybody that hasn't been there. And um, it really is important to take that time and nurture yourself. Just not easy to do. Right. So in wrapping up, is there anything that I haven't asked you about that you're like, oh, here's something else that I really want people to know. Here's another tip. Anything else? Um, now we've covered a lot of ground. Thank you for asking that, Kathy. We, we've covered mm. a lot, and um, I'm okay. I'm hopeful I'm hopeful that this is helpful to um, any, any of you that have experienced anything that we've discussed. And um, like I said earlier, if you want to get in touch and and chat with me, feel free to do so. Um, go to smashingtheplateau.com or call us two one two seven three one zero seven seven zero. And we will have all of that in our show notes also. And I just want to tell everyone, if you want to learn more from David um, before contacting him, I highly recommend his podcasts because they are really packed with information and you can learn a lot from that. In fact, David, I'm going to also suggest that if somebody is feeling really low for whatever reason, that they go check out your podcast because you've got excellent information there also that will help them with that. And you have them so clearly identified on what the topics are. They can really scan through them and find what they really want to listen to right then and get a pick me up. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much for being here today, David. I really appreciate you. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to Dare to Leap. Say hello and access additional resources at virtualexperttraining.com. There, you'll be able to connect with Kathy to share your feedback and join her community. Join us again soon on Dare to Leap. Until then. Mm -hmm.